Hey, what's going on everybody? How's it going? My name is Aaron Hilliard. This is Mushroom Wonderland. And if you're new to this channel, I talk a lot about mushrooms here. Mainly what I do is I go out into the forest and find wild mushrooms of all different types. So edible ones, poisonous ones, even hallucinogenic ones. We just talk about mushrooms in general on this channel. Uh, like I said, my name is Aaron Hilliard. I am the vice president of the local mycological society here on the Kitsap Peninsula in Western Washington. And uh, I've been a mushroom enthusiast my whole life. My grandma got me into mushrooms when I was a young kid and we would go into the woods and pick mushrooms, whatever we would find. We would bring them back to her house and look at the field guides and try to discover what they were. When she passed away when I was 15 years old, I got all of her field guides and continued foraging every year uh, in the forests, mainly in the fall for uh, mainly wild edible mushrooms uh, like chanterelles and lobster mushrooms. When I was a teenager, I discovered um, psychedelic mushrooms and stuff like that and did a little experimentation. It definitely helped to broaden my interest in mushrooms and in mycology. And I just kind of followed mushrooms then with the advent of the internet and all these identification forums. And I have since uh, started Mushroom Wonderland here on YouTube, on Instagram, and on TikTok. So if you uh, like this kind of content, make sure on those platforms to follow me over there and uh, give a thumbs up to uh, videos like this if you get value out of content like this. And also uh, leave a positive comment. I want to know where you are and what kind of mushrooms you're looking for. So right now it is the dead of summer in Western Washington. It is what we call the dog days of summer. And I follow the Facebook forums pretty closely about what's growing out there right now and what isn't. And I'm also spending a lot of time in the forest um, myself looking for what mushrooms are growing out here. In Western Washington right now, very, very scarce. Uh, on the Facebook forums, I am seeing people find lobster mushrooms down in Oregon, especially Central Oregon out towards the coast, uh, rainbow chanterelles. Around here, you can find some summer chanterelles. They're kind of starting to dry up. Uh, there's typically a flush of chanterelles that come out in July, and that's probably the most popular wild edible mushroom here in Washington State. So anyways, I'm going to talk about five of the easiest to identify most delicious wild edible mushrooms you can find in the forest in western Washington for yourself. So most of these mushrooms grow, they prefer it in the autumn, but they can start in late summer if there's enough moisture. Um, like I had already mentioned, chanterelles can start growing in July. Uh, if there's the right moisture, there's uh, typically a small fruiting of golden Pacific chanterelles or cantharellus formosus that grows in the beginning of summer. And uh, so those are out in the woods right now, but, uh, but we're gonna take a look at these five different mushrooms. Hopefully just entertain you and kind of satiate your mycophilia if you're, a, if you're a mycophile, which means you're a person who has this strange interest in mushrooms. You have totally found the right channel if that's what you are. Uh, this channel has been around about a year and a half and have grown to 25,000 plus subscribers. So really cool stuff. Loving what I'm doing. I'm loving the support of all of you guys. So let's take a look at these five mushrooms that you can go out and forage and cook and eat for yourself. Thanks for joining Mushroom Wonderland. Let's go. For our first mushroom, we're gonna be talking about probably the most popular wild edible mushroom here in Washington State that is commonly known as the Pacific Golden Chanterelle. It goes by the scientific name Cantharellus formosus. There's also a relative uh, different species of chanterelle known as the white chanterelle that's also popular here that grows in the fall known as Cantharella subobitis and out on the coastal regions mainly in Oregon and southern Washington in the coastal foothills uh, the fog belt area of the ocean creates a perfect habitat for a summer type of chanterelle known as Cantharellus roseocanus or the uh, rainbow chanterelle, but today we're going to be talking about Pacific Golden Chanterelle. Super easy to identify, very common in the forest here in the Pacific Northwest, and a very delicious one for most people. But just like with any wild mushroom, make sure that you only eat a small amount first because even though it's edible for most people, um, a mushroom like a chanterelle will cause me severe gastrointestinal distress, and it doesn't do that to most people. Be sure to start with a small amount. Um, never eat like you know a pound of mushrooms to yourself they're really not meant to be eaten that way they're meant to be an accompaniment um, I wouldn't try to just 
go pick 10 pounds of chanterelles and just have a meal purely of chanterelles, you might get a bellyache. Uh, it's a little bit hard to digest that much um, chitin, uh, which is around the cell wall of the mushroom that needs to be broke down by cooking. So again, you gotta cook mushrooms. Don't pick chanterelles in the forest wild and eat them. Uh, not only do they have this chitin layer around the cell wall that makes it impossible for your system to digest it, but they can also contain parasites and different bugs that you just don't wanna be eating and taking into your system. So make sure to cook your mushrooms, all mushrooms well, even grocery store button mushrooms. But the golden chanterelle can be found in the conifer forest here in Western Washington. Um, and there are several species of chanterelle that grow all around the world, lots of different species of cantharellus here in the Northwest, we're talking mainly about Cantharellus formosus. And it's a, a relatively large chanterelle, but in the summer, uh, due to a lack of moisture, they will still fruit, but they'll be pretty small. And so um, the chanterelle is probably the first ones I ever learned to forage because my grandma sent me in the woods and she said, go find some big orange mushrooms and pick those and bring them back and, and we'll have a look at them to, to make sure that that's the ones we're looking for. And I headed out amongst the, uh, the Douglas fir trees and the uh, Salal and Oregon grape, you know, the coniferous forest undergrowth. And I started to see these ruffly orange mushrooms as she had described. So some of the main characteristics of the golden chanterelle, again, they're gonna be roughly looking, very irregular kind of vase shaped cap. They're, uh, they're off, you know, often really bright orange. In the summer, they look kind of a sherbet color. Again, the morphology changes a little bit due to the lack of moisture in July versus the chanterelles you're gonna find in October around here. But it's the same mushroom, it just looks a little bit different. They have a unique smell, it's kind of sweet. They have a very unique smell. They don't smell like any other mushroom. So odor is a factor. But mainly looking at what would be called the gills on a regular like grocery store button mushroom, Chanterelles actually have veins rather than gills, but these are still the structures where the spores are produced. So, so if you're really new to mushrooms, uh, I'll break it down just like this. Plants have seeds, mushrooms have spores. Plants bear their seeds out of flowers. A mushroom grows its spores within the ridges of gills or of veins. So in chanterelles, the, uh, the, the spores are growing on those veins that run decurrent down the stem. So decurrent, meaning uh, they run down the stem. They don't stop in a straight line. That is like probably the most easy and foolproof way to identify a chanterelle. But just like with almost every mushroom I found, there are always exceptions to the rule. So I have found chanterelles that appear to not be decurrent, although they are, it's just pure circum, you know, just a, it's just pure coincidence that they happen to all kind of end in a straight line on the stem. It doesn't mean that that's not a chanterelle or that it's not decurrent. It's just not showing heavily those characteristics of the decurrent gills that, or veins of a chanterelle. So Pacific golden chanterelle uh, are a mycorrhizal mushroom. That means they grow in, a, in association with a host tree. So um, there are two main types of mushrooms. We have mycorrhizal mushrooms and we have saprotrophic mushrooms. Saprotrophs like to grow on decaying matter and like manure and stuff like that. The grocery store button mushroom you get, the, uh, the button mushroom or the cremini or the portobello, all the same mushroom known as agaricus bisporus. Those are actually a saprotrophic mushroom. So they're growing off of decaying matter within uh, like manure or compost. Whereas these mushrooms, they grow in association with the trees and they actually have enzymes in the mycelium underground that's breaking down uh, nutrients in the soil, making it available. The trees get to suck up some of those nutrients that the mycelium is breaking down. And in return, the tree sends some carbohydrates, some sugars out to the end of its root tips where these, the mycelium literally wraps around the tips of the tree roots and the mushrooms can, well not the mushrooms, but the mycelium will be will be feeding on those carbohydrates from the tree. So they work in association with each other. It's a really cool thing. And so without the trees, you don't have the mushrooms. You can have the trees without the mushrooms, but they don't seem to grow nearly as healthy or vigorous. And so when you have a tree and mushroom association uh, like that established, it actually helps the tree to grow healthier. So the key to looking for golden chanterelles is to go find the trees that they grow with. It's much easier to track down mycorrhizal mushrooms because you just look for the trees that grow with those mushrooms. 
uh, saprotrophic mushrooms. The spores are just kind of out on the wind. And if they land in some sort of a substrate that they can grow in, spores can mate together and produce a mushroom. And in a way that makes you know mushrooms exciting because they're mysterious. You're not really sure where they're gonna show up. But every fall, I can go to the same spot where I found chanterelles last year. They're gonna be growing there again this year provided that the trees are still there. You cannot really grow chanterelles in a laboratory. They've been trying it for years and years, never really found a successful way to, uh, to profitably grow chanterelles, you know, cultivated, um, because they require these big mature trees. And even then in a lab setting, when they try to hook the mushrooms up with the mature trees, uh, the chances that they're actually gonna like form a partnership are pretty rare. And even if they do, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get fruiting bodies. So it's just a, it's a real crapshoot. So what has to happen is people go out into the forest and they forage for these mushrooms, they pick them wild, then they sell them to the market. And you can find them at Safeway, Larry's Market, Whole Foods, any grocery store in the autumn nowadays will usually have a little section of chanterelles, especially like more gourmet grocery stores are gonna be carrying mushrooms like chanterelles, but you'll notice that the prices are like $20 a pound or more, whereas you can go out into the forest and find them yourself. So here's what you're looking for, coniferous forest with a, a huckleberry, salal, Oregon grape undergrowth. You want a mossy floor in the forest, you know, not a lot of sunlight, not a lot of wind. They don't like sunlight, they don't like wind. They want a stale, damp environment to grow in, and they do break that rule in July, but mushrooms are just a little bit mysterious like that, so they do what they want. But we can pretty much guess that if you're going into that coniferous forest with the mossy floor, with the salal and the huckleberry, and you hike around enough after it's been raining for a couple weeks in the autumn here in the Pacific Northwest, you will eventually stumble across a ruffly orange mushroom on the forest floor, and that is what is known as a chanterelle, one of the most popular and widely eaten wild edible mushrooms here in Washington State. So go out there into your forest, look for that checklist. When you're looking at that mushroom, you're gonna have the current veins, it's the orange color, unique smell. The stem always kind of tapers at the bottom, and they're vase shaped. So the chanterelle has got a really tough stem. You can pinch it really hard and it won't explode on you. It just kind of, uh, it'll make kind of a squeaky rubbery sound. So you can head out there, find your chanterelles. They do not grow in the spring. They do not grow in late winter and they're not gonna grow in the dead of summer except for some little spots where you're gonna find little tiny buttons that are the summer chanterelles. Uh, the summer fruiting, same mushrooms, Cantharellus formosus here in Western Washington will fruit in July, even without a lot of rain, but you can find huge contorted ones as big as your head in the fall when there's enough rain for them to soak up. And, uh, and remember, these are just the fruiting bodies, so it's like, it's like the apple tree in the apple, right? Like the apple tree would be that mycelium, which is underground, you don't even see that part of it. And when it produces a reproductive sexual organ is going to be this fruiting body and that is what you see as the macro fungi or the mushroom that's growing on the forest floor and it's spreading you know millions and billions of spores out into the air and these little spores can land but instead of uh you know mating like a like a male and a female there's actually a couple of thousand different genders that they can be compatible with within one uh, species of mushroom so Really interesting stuff, getting into some kind of advanced mycology. We're gonna stop there and move on to our next mushroom, but I hope you get out there, find some chanterelles this year, cook them up, and again, try a small amount because poor people like me, we just can't eat them. So there you go, Pacific Golden Chanterelle. All right, the next mushroom that I'm gonna be talking about today, popular wild edible mushroom here in Washington State, known as the lobster mushroom, or Hypomyces lactiflorum. And Hypomyces lactiflorum is actually the name of a parasite that parasitizes another mushroom and turns it into a lobster mushroom. And to add to the confusion there, these mushrooms are also mycorrhizal. So the mushroom that is the host needs the tree to associate with, and this host mushroom is known as the Russula brevipes, or the Russula, or the Russula brevipes. This mushroom is very vase-shaped. It's been described as the most boring mushroom in the forest. That is, until or if it gets parasitized by this parasitic fungus that will contort it and turn it this orange-red color, and then, uh, and then it becomes what we know as a lobster mushroom. It takes on this really fishy scent, 
A lot of people say when it's cooked it tastes just like lobster or crab. Um, it's kind of a weird situation. The two mushrooms come together. The Russell of Breva peas by itself, not a very desirable mushroom. They grow huge in the forest. When they're contorted with the parasitic uh, fungus of Hypomyces lactiflorum, they can look completely different. Sometimes they barely even emerge from the needle duff on the forest floor. But these are gonna be found pretty much in the same habitat that you're gonna be finding Pacific Golden Chanterelles. But, uh, but the lobster mushroom, they tend to hide a little bit better, although they often have this really bright orange color, so they're easy to spot when you see that little bit of orange, that's when you slow down and you start to look closer, maybe even lifting, lifting up little humps in the, in the forest floor, we call them shrumps, and, and there'll be a hidden mushroom under there. Um, these ones do have that fishy smell, and the gills are not very obvious because oftentimes they've been completely contorted from the Hypomyces lactiflorum, but they definitely have this unique orange color that you're not really gonna find on any other mushroom around here besides chicken of the woods, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. But either one of those are good edible mushrooms. So lobster mushrooms, again, a mushroom you can find in gourmet grocers. Uh, I've seen them at Pike Place Market selling for $39.99 a pound. Again, you can find these in the same kind of forest. So it's growing in association with a with a Douglas fir or a Western hemlock, typically here in Western Washington. Uh, they're gonna be in a moss covered floor type situation, salal brush, black huckleberry, red huckleberry, Oregon grape. So this is the kind of forest that's gonna support these mushrooms, but I do seem to find them in areas that maybe get a little more sunlight than chanterelles. I often seem to find a lot of uh, wild blackberry growing where I find lobster mushrooms. Very similar habitat to the Pacific Golden Chanterelle. And these ones uh, can often be really contorted. I'll use a stiff bristled paintbrush to kind of get the dirt out of all the cracks and crevices and uh, cut off the stump, you know. Um, it really doesn't matter whether you pluck these mushrooms or cut them. Uh, that's pretty much the rule for all mushrooms. I don't think it's gonna harm the mycelium if you need to pluck them out. But a lot of people try to cut, cut them off at the base uh, especially to keep soil out of your basket so that you don't get dirt in there. And especially with uh, lobster mushrooms, they have a tendency to carry a lot of dirt and trail flare. And so uh, these mushrooms are a little bit more difficult to clean. If I have one that's really contorted, has big crevices, I'll often cut it so that I can use my stiff bristle brush to brush and clean out those areas. But uh, you slice these up and, sh and uh, saute them, give them a little bit of butter and put them with a steak and it tastes a bit like surf and turf. So really cool mushrooms really fun ones to find my kids think those are the best ones to find probably because they're the easiest to find and it's really exciting when you find a lobster mushroom um, and that's usually where the hunt begins that's usually where the hunt begins when you find your first lobster mushroom slow down start to look closer you'll notice little lumps in the grass and stuff just lightly move the grass back we're not trying to tear up the forest floor I've seen people who have actually raked the forest floor looking for lobster mushrooms and infuriated me. Oh my gosh, do not do that. It is not necessary. If you can't see them, then, you know, look harder or, or move on. But don't start tearing up the whole forest floor. That, that destroys and disturbs so much uh, habitat. I just can't stand when people do that. Anyways, I digress. Rant over. Hypomyces lactiflorum parasitizing a Russell of Breva peas who's in association with a Western hemlock or the Douglas fir. Quite a relationship going on here, but, uh, but you can be the fourth piece in this relationship if you head out in the woods. Again, another fall mushroom. So Hypomyces lactiflorum or the lobster mushroom, you're gonna find that when the rains come. And right now, uh, people are finding them in Southern Oregon. Uh, they do tend to show up rain or no rain in some areas. So again, they break the rules. There's just not really any hard, fast rules. I'm just giving you examples of, from my experience of where I find the most uh, lobster mushrooms is after the rains have really started. And here that would be late September to early October is when I would go to my lobster patches. And I've been doing this a long time and I have a lot of luck finding lobster mushrooms. So this is just based on my experience. You may have a different experience. Please share it in the comments. You know, that's cool because we want to hear from everybody in this community. But uh, right now I haven't found any lobster mushrooms growing here in Western Washington. Although I haven't gone specifically to any of my lobster spots, which I plan on doing really soon, just out of curiosity. I like to see what that habitat looks like throughout the year. And uh, if I do find any, 
look for another video about early lobsters. You know, I'd be happy to report back that I found lobsters. Those ones don't upset my stomach. And uh, yeah, looking forward to finding some of those these years. Looking forward to finding more lobster mushrooms. So the Hypomyces lactiflorum, or the lobster mushroom makes number two on our list of easy mushrooms to identify that are delicious to eat around here. All right, moving on to mushroom number three, and today we're gonna be talking about another popular bright orange colored mushroom you can find in the forest here in the Pacific Northwest known as the chicken of the woods, or Latiparus sulfurius, or Latiparus uh, conifericola. We have two species that grow here commonly. One of them grows on hardwood, one of them grows on conifers. Um, both of them look similar. They've got a really orange look, uh, kind of getting more yellow towards the, uh, towards the outer edge. And uh, they're juicier um, towards the edge and towards you know, the, the wood where they're growing on. They're gonna be a little more woody, so a lot of people prefer to just cut the outside edge of these mushrooms off. These mushrooms are actually saprotrophic, so they like to eat decaying matter rather than living in association with a tree like the mycorrhizal mushrooms we were talking about. That makes chicken of the woods a little bit more difficult to find. It's hard to track one down. It's more like you're out looking for something else and then you stumble across a chicken of the woods or some people just call it a cow in the forest, you know, C-O-W, chicken of the woods. Some people claim that the chicken of the woods that grows on the conifer or the uh, Latiparus con conifericola, that that one causes more cases of gastrointestinal distress than the hardwood loving variety. But, uh, but I've heard, uh, you know, both mushrooms uh, being eaten as delectable, edible mushrooms. So this is a pretty tough one to confuse with any other mushrooms. And uh, for the most part, it's totally edible. Again, like the chanterelles, you just wanna eat a little bit to make sure it's gonna agree with your system. But these grow in a big spray of orange shelf conch-like mushrooms that are gonna be growing on a dead log. So typically a log that's laying down you'll find a big flush of these mushrooms. And the mycelium has eaten its way through the wood, and then it's grown these big shelves of orange mushrooms that you can harvest and uh, eat. A lot of people say it tastes just like chicken. When you do find one, it's exciting. Unfortunately, another mushroom a lot like this that is not gonna make it into this video, the cauliflower mushroom, is just about as exciting to find as a chicken of the woods. But a chicken of the woods, great edible mushroom. Again, try just a little bit to get started. And uh, you really can't confuse this with too many other mushrooms. So that makes it number three on our list is chicken of the woods or the Latiparus sulfurius. This next mushroom on the list just happens to be my personal favorite mushroom to find around here. It took me like 15 years of stumbling around in the woods until I found my own patch and they recur every year. So I'm so excited. Typically in the third to fourth week of September, I'm going to start seeing the fruiting bodies of what is known as Boletus edulis or the porcini mushroom. Porcini is Italian for little piggies because they grow in these fat little balls and they've got really, really thick stems and they've got this spongy surface underneath there. And that's one way you're gonna be able to identify that it is a boletus or a type of bolete. Bolete is sort of a generic term for a lot of different mushrooms that have a spongy like surface underneath the cap. Um, most of these around here are safe to eat. But right here in, the, in Western Washington, you're typically safe to eat uh, any kind of bolete if you cook it a lot. So the porcini has a very unique uh, characteristic on the stipe, that's the mycological term for the stem of the mushroom. It's gonna have what's called reticulation, and so it looks a lot like a spider web or something growing uh, all over the side of the stem. It's gonna have that sponge surface, and these are so nutty. They go for $50 a pound at Pike Place Market. Super delicious mushrooms. If you come across these, keep this patch a secret. They're gonna grow back every year, and you're gonna thank yourself for keeping it a secret because everybody wants porcinis. So the Boletus edulis or porcinis, number four, but number one on my list. And coming in at number five on our list is gonna be the Shaggy Parasol, or Chlorophyllum oliverii. This mushroom is a delicious one. One of the first mushrooms that I ever found that I was really curious about. I thought it looked delicious, but you cannot just look at a mushroom and, and know if it's edible or not. So I think mushrooms can look delicious, but that has no bearing on their edibility. But I found a big flush of these growing in my mom's pasture when I was a kid. I actually took some to the Mycological Society way before I was a member. And I asked one of the members, what is this mushroom? And he said, wow, that's an amazing mushroom. Where did you find these? 
If I didn't know anything, I knew that you don't tell somebody where your patch is. So I said, I found them somewhere around Port Orchard, Washington. But some of the characteristics of this mushroom is it's got a really scaly cap, kind of a fluffy or shaggy looking cap. That's how it gets the name, the shaggy parasol. Parasol just meaning an umbrella, which most macro fungi look a bit like an umbrella. This mushroom, the shaggy parasol usually grows in a big troop and it is also saprotrophic, so it's not growing in association with trees. A little trickier to find and it's exciting when you find them. And it's usually grown in a big patch or a troop of these mushrooms. One of the characteristics of this mushroom is the cap easily breaks off of the stem. Um, also, the little ring on the stem, you can often slide it up and down. It actually is free from the stem. And, uh, and another really important characteristic is that the flesh is gonna stain kind of a rusty orange color uh, just within a minute after being broke or damaged. This is one of the most important features. Uh, these mushrooms have white gills and white spores, a lot like amanitas, which can be dangerous. But if you have that shaggy top of the cap, the ring that moves up and down on the stem, and it's got that reddish staining or bruising, then you're in luck with the uh, Chlorophyllum olivarii. Down south of here, they have uh, Chlorophyllum racodes, which looks awfully similar to this, but not exactly the same. And it's also a good edible mushroom. And there is one mushroom in this genus uh, called Chlorophyllum molybdides that doesn't grow here in Western Washington, but it has a green spore print, unlike these other two that I've talked about are gonna have a white spore print. So um, the shaggy parasol or Chlorophyllum olivarii, this one tastes a lot to me like a portobello or something, really good with steak. Uh, but again, just eat a little bit to make sure they're good with you. My system handles them just fine and I can't eat chanterelles, but uh, always really exciting if I find a patch of these shaggy parasols. Uh, so if you find some, gather them up because they're not gonna grow back there next year. So feel lucky if you found some because you are. So that's number five on our list. So thanks for joining me today on Mushroom Wonderland. I hope you got some value out of this video and uh, we're gonna keep coming at you with mushroom videos. Right now it's the dead of summer so there's not a ton of mushrooms out here to go find. So we're gonna talk about mushrooms for a few episodes and then when the fall rains come back, We've got big plans for mushroom identification and foraging videos, really, really good footage. We're gonna have some awesome guests coming up, hopefully gonna be doing some traveling and making videos abroad all about mushrooms. And we've also got a mushroom video coming up where we drive to Telluride, Colorado to Mushroom Fest, the biggest mushroom festival in the country is held in the mountains of Colorado in August. So my wife and I are making the trek out there, looking forward to making a video about that and the experiences we have and the people we meet. So uh, thank you again for joining Mushroom Wonderland and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Much love everybody, peace.